Hey, Canucks fans, back with another Zoom chat. And I'm thrilled to be speaking to my friend, Ronell Desai. Ronell is a big part of our Canucks experience in the arena as one of the in-arena hosts. I can't wait to speak to him. He's interviewed me for his radio shows a couple of times, but now I get to return the favor and just kind of figure out what it's like to handle so many crazy things happening at one time, at the same time, making sure that we as fans enjoy the experience. So Ronell, thank you for joining me here today. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Really looking forward to this. I know we've been chatting for uh, quite some time, really since uh, the preseason days of having this conversation. And as you mentioned before, back when I was working at a radio station a few years ago, we had a chance to communicate and have some great conversations then as well. So I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah, thanks for having me, man. Oh, my pleasure. And yes, we thought this would be a good time. The Canucks are away for a couple yeah. of weeks now. Uh, Going to go on this four game road trip as we record this on Sunday. And uh, yeah, it gives you a chance to breathe, do some other stuff, catch up on family. So let's start there. Uh, talk <laughs> about your, your family life and your professional life outside of the Rogers Arena in-game hosts. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I'm recently married. So uh, that was a, a milestone that we celebrated over uh, the last couple of weeks here. And uh, born and raised here in, in Vancouver, BC. I've uh, been a Canuck fan since uh, the uh, the mid-90s when I used to watch hockey with my grandfather, who religiously still to this day watches the Vancouver Canucks. And, um, you know, born and raised here in the city of Vancouver, uh, only child here. Uh, parents migrated here from the Fiji Islands and they moved to Vancouver in the 80s. So they've virtually been raised uh, and grew up here in Vancouver as well. But, mm. you know, fast forward there, decided to pursue broadcasting. I think from an early age, Clay, I had an opportunity to like participate in many cultural events and, and be behind the mic similar to yourself. And I think that passion sort of resulted in me finding a direction of where I wanted my career to go, or at least what I wanted to do. Obviously our career takes us in many different paths, but I know exactly what I want to do in regards to, I know this makes me feel good. I know I enjoy it. And how can I continue to master this craft? And, um, you know, I went to SFU and studied yeah. communication and marketing there. And uh, following that, went to BCIT for the broadcast program. And then from there, that's really kind of where the professional experiences started in regards to like working in this realm, in this field. Worked at TSN following my time at uh, BCIT. Was one of the many interns of Sakaris and Price. Uh, <laughs> they sort of opened the door. I think this, this was back in maybe 2014. I think T-Mart was actually the producer for the Sakaris and Price show uh, back when I was interning there. But yeah, that really opened the door, I think, for me to solidify that this is an industry that I want to continue to participate in and continue to be involved in. Obviously, just being a fan of the game and being a yeah. fan of just sports in general, I knew this is where, you know, my heart lies. And this is where that passion, where I can exercise that passion. So fast forward there, I've been pretty much working at TSN up until the uh, abrupt uh, stoppage uh, last year. Yeah. Um, so at that time, I was also working at CTV. Um, for their morning show with a traffic host there as well. And that was a great opportunity that I got to sort of exercise some television experience, but it was always sort of a, a part-time experience outside of broadcasting. I work in marketing for a local company called Centra windows, oh, okay. um, the marketing manager there. So that's kind of like my full-time day-to-day office job. Uh, and then on the side, I kind of, you know, exercise these uh, passion projects like this, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun ride being involved in the, in the media landscape, as I'm sure you're very, very familiar with. And, uh, getting to know many talented individuals with a wealth of experience and knowledge that we have here in the sports industry. So it's been a pleasure working alongside many of these individuals uh, throughout my professional experiences. And this is just sort of the the new one that uh, sort of came up uh, recently. And I decided, decided to take upon this opportunity and, and give it a shot. Oh, that's awesome. And I know that we've always gotten along very well, but we're very similar in that. You, so you have a full-time gig with Central Windows, uh, a full-time yeah. job, more than a gig. Yeah. And then all of your media, whether it's TV, radio, internship, and now with the Canucks, that's on the side on top of your full-time job. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I know from a young age at BCIT, it was always funny because we always used to have guest speakers come in at BCIT <laughs> to speak to the class. And one thing they had always mentioned was that, you know, this industry is very, very tough and it's important to ensure that, you know, you have good job security. These are sort of these different types of values and stuff that they instructed us and taught us from an early age. But from that BCIT day, I figured to myself that I'm always going to love the side of broadcasting, but I don't know if I want to continue to have it as my foundation because we know it's a tough industry. Yeah. It's very cutthroat and sort of TSN is another example, like the oh, abrupt yeah. departure that take yeah. place, the ever-changing landscape and dynamic of this industry really makes it tough for someone who is trying to set a foundation for themselves and really um, 
you know, have that sort of solid ground that they can sort of leverage off from. So, so yeah, Center Windows is my sort of full-time gig and uh, I work there in marketing, have been there for the last five years, but broadcasting was always just the part-time passion projects that I can continue to participate in. And it's always been such a joy because it hasn't felt like a full-time. It's never really been full-time, but I'm never tired of it. So whenever I get to go to a Canucks game or whenever I had the opportunity to go to CTV, that excitement was always there because it just wasn't as consistent as maybe I would have wanted it to be. But yeah. um, it's always been a, a joy. And I'm really grateful for all the professional experiences that I've had, um, albeit they were part-time. Well, man, I can hear myself saying similar words, especially, you know, you know, I'm working full time for the Catholic Church and then the bishop sees me with my my jersey on going to a game and he goes, oh, are you going to your real job now? Ha ha ha. So, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's because we love it. We put our heart and soul into it. But we also yeah. recognize, at least in my spot, that this YouTube thing, I love it. It's a, it's a passion project, as like you said, but it still is a hobby. Like, I'm not going to be able to quit my job full time. And just as I presume, you probably can't quit Central and just do Canuck stuff yet. Maybe down the road, but maybe not yet. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, you always want to do what you enjoy doing as well. So I'm not yeah. fortunate. I'm sure you can say the same. I speak probably on your behalf when I say this, that, you know, yeah. you enjoy your full time work, you enjoy sure. you're passionate about it. Yeah. So it's not a, it's not an opportunity for me to like, I want to do more broadcasting so I could potentially depart the full time. I'm just very grateful and fortunate for the opportunity to enjoy both. But I also have a chance to exercise a passion of mine that was sort of sparked from a young age. And that passion is public speaking really yeah. and that public speaking has led to then okay cool ctv experience tsn experience connects experiences it's just almost cherries on top because i love sports now i can practice public speaking in that realm in that landscape um that that i'm just very very grateful for oh i love it and oh i i knew when i asked you to do this that i would have no problem um getting not only getting you to speak but because you you are a good pro polished professional public speaker you also know how to, uh, I, I, I just know, I, I should stop just talking about how, <laughs> how good this interview is and, and just keep on going with the interview. But yes, uh, because I've known you for seven or eight years, I do know that yeah. you've done some public speaking as well, uh, emceeing weddings and parties. That's yeah. pretty cool. And, and, and that's another thing that we, we have in common. So tell me how you have all this. And I, I think the local media experience that you've gone through studying through SMU sure. and BKT, I think that's very inspiring and a very realistic career path for anyone trying to break in. But how of does course. it get from all that into, hey, the Canucks are looking for a, an in arena host. Hey, maybe that's for me. So walk us through that. Yeah. I mean, at the time, which was, you know, this past off season, they had posted the, um, the job posting on Instagram, on Facebook, hey, hey, we're looking for a new in arena host. And at that time, that was shortly, I think, after um, TSN came to the abrupt ending that it did. And then my time at CTV was slowly coming to an end as well. Uh, so overall, sort of my Bell Media um, experience was coming to an end. So I figured to myself, well, okay, well, luckily, I am able to, you know, go to work every single day. But now my, my broadcasting side of my day to day schedule doesn't exist anymore. There's no more TSN, there's no more CTV. Do I still want to ha have this in my schedule, have this in my routine and balance and juggle all of these items because now I'm, you know, doing other things. Now I have a wife and there's other things that come into mind when it comes to just the day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities and scheduling. But at this time in my life, I feel like I'm still very, very um, capable of juggling many different items. So I said, you know what, how can I continue to enter the broadcasting field if these opportunities no longer exist. In comes the Canucks posting. I said, oh my goodness, I have to apply for this. I love emceeing, I love public speaking. This is almost like a, like the missing puzzle piece that I've been looking for for such a long time where not only is it for a team and in an arena that I've been a part of and I had a chance to intern with the Canucks back when I was at SFU, so it would come full uh. circle, but I figured, you know what, I got to give this a shot. And it felt like a long shot, to be honest, Clay, because I would imagine they probably received tons of submissions and they received tons of great submissions, but um, saw the posting, decided to shoot this video right here uh, in, in the family room and yeah. just give it a shot. When I look back at that video, by the way, oh, it's I, I cringe at times because now really? I know that there's certain, well, there's certain things that yeah. I've learned as a result of now being um, a part of the team that you probably shouldn't do. <laughs> but looking back at that video, it was good enough to get, to get myself in the door in front of the right people and to have those conversations. Literally getting in the door. Part of your video was you coming in the house and say, hey, Canucks, <laughs> it, was, it was, 
I watched it. I shared it. It was good, man. It was good. And appreciate uh, it. that. No, that is awesome. So then, uh, yeah, just quickly this part, cause I want to get into actually the nuts and bolts of you doing it. Um, how was the audition progress w- process? Was there yeah. even an audition or was it your video? And that was your audition. No. So the, the first part of the audition was, were video submission, uh, yeah. submissions. So, um, I'm sure they received quite a few of them had a chance to look on YouTube and, and see others as well. And there were some really great submissions. They were fun. They were comical. They were, they were natural. Um, and I probably received an email probably two to three weeks later, but I will say, I want to thank you for sharing that video. I was very fortunate. I realized, and it sort of felt very overwhelming at the time where a lot of individuals that I worked with, um, also shared that video. And I think that was very, it was a very rewarding feeling when you have your friends or your colleagues that obviously you have existing relationships with, but you may not be as close just based off just, you know, just working life and professional life. But when you see those types of actions done um, on the social sphere, which we know in our landscape and in our media industry, that's very, very impactful. It's very, very important. So when I saw the boatload of individuals that I've worked with in the past, maybe haven't spoken to and God knows, you know, how long, but having them share the video and um, just showcase their support was very, very rewarding. So I definitely want to acknowledge that as well, because that probably um, had a lot to do with making sure that the right people saw it and Mm. it put it, it put it in the eyes of the right team. Um, but yeah, I received an email from the Canucks, uh, you know, two to three weeks later after posting the video. And then uh, we came into Rogers Arena and there were around 15 of us there. And now the second part of the audition was rehearsing in the arena, in an empty arena in front of the mic, which itself was kind of an adjustment. You're not yeah. dealing with the echo yes. and you're not really sure how to. And then you're also dealing with the fear of like, holy smokes, I'm in Rogers Arena. Like this is I've made it this far. This is an accomplishment. <laughs> how do I go to the next step? So they actually recorded those auditions. Um, for, you know, for their in-house team to sort of analyze and, and go through. And then following that, um, I was fortunate enough to make it to the top three. And the mm. top three at the time were asked to then host for all the preseason games. So I believe there are around three preseason games back in yeah. September. And then they had some time following the preseason because I believe the Canucks started off on a nine-game road trip. It was a pretty extensive road trip to kick off this season. So yeah. the first home game wasn't until around October 26th, the end of October. So they had some time to think about it. But I found out I got the role uh, following the preseason, probably about 10 days or so before, um, you know, the home opener. Yeah. And obviously I was ecstatic. I'm not going to lie to you. Prior to that anticipation, there were many moments where I was pacing around this home <laughs> thinking, should I follow up with the Canucks? Should I, should I get more people to share it? How do I, how do I secure this? Because it was so close at that time. Yeah. Now I just, I saw the finish line yeah. and the pursuit was such a joy to be a part of. How do I, how do I secure this? And, you know, I was very fortunate to, to get that phone call and uh, secure the position. And I, um, you know, be one of the in arena hosts for the Vancouver Canucks, which is just um, an opportunity that I'm very, very proud of and enjoy so much. And I'm also had the ability to host alongside Hannah Bernard, who's been a host for the Vancouver yes. Canucks in that position for quite some time. And her wealth of experience and knowledge brings so much to the team, along with our hype host, Ilan, uh, who also went through a similar process as I did. What a team. So it's you and Hannah basically splitting the, the hosting duties and then yeah elon is the hype man who who Correct. in essence does uh, you do some hype he does some hosting so you're your team of three together that's awesome man that is awesome yeah i think i think they had mentioned clay that um because in the past they actually haven't had multiple hosts yeah but if you go to other arenas um vegas being an example i think they have around three to four in arena hosts where there's mm-hmm. just constant back and forth um you know may have one host in one section they go to the other host in the other section yeah. there's more opportunity to be creative Yes. And um, exercise different types of things that you can do with multiple hosts and multiple talents all under one roof. Yep. So that was something that they want to try this year. And um, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Excellent point, because when I we do speaking things, too, especially if you're co MC so, or speaking, sometimes the audience will resonate more with one host sure. hostess than the other one so it's nice yeah. to have that balance for sure no i i want to get i'm a bit of a nerd when as you know when it comes to like the technical production stuff so i'll get into that in a second i remember it was so funny i saw you at one of the exhibition games i saw you doing it and then i remember saying oh congratulations you're, and you're so humble like, hey clay you know it's not mine yet it's just it's just a trial so i'm really glad that uh i'm really glad that it, it came true for you that oh, that's awesome you. no that is awesome I, okay I'm a bit of a nerd, but I don't yeah, care. Let's go. I, I want to ask it. some technical questions. So my first one is, given the, I presume you're wearing an in-ear. I presume you got yeah. someone yapping at you. There's yeah. 18,000, now there's 19,000 people there. And uh, and there's the echo with the, you know, you're hearing a one second delay. 
what's it like? Is that a pretty stressful time or do, was it hard for you to adjust or was it a pretty quick adjustment? Because there's a lot going on at one time. Yeah, I, um, I will say like my experience as a live host definitely helped in regards to ad-libbing and speaking yeah. in front of an audience. However, speaking in front of 18, 19,000 people live, I've never obviously done before. But all of in, all of the things that you mentioned in conjunction does provide a little bit of learning that is required and experience that is required to get used to it. The in-ear, yes. So there's a producer that is on the 500 level that yeah. is constantly counting you down before your time um, is coming up. They also are speaking in your ear if you need to wrap up or if you need to take more time or ask wow. a question or speed it up. And that at times can be confusing because you know you're getting some uh, you're getting some words of wisdom in your ear while maybe speaking to someone or uh, <laughs> trying to remember your lines while you're speaking in front of the camera. But those those words of wisdom in your ear are always very very helpful and they do a very good job of kind of preparing you and making sure that hey you have five seconds left yeah. and Renell go or right. wrap it up. So that I presume place. they're very calm. They're 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 certain, yeah. but they've got to be calm on the other side because they can't be freaking you out by <laughs> of course. Yeah, no, definitely. So that in conjunction with just I think the echo, one thing that I didn't realize until kind of now doing the job for uh, a few months is actually very hard to hear yourself. Yes. Especially when you're in the arena or especially when you're in the lower bowl or on the ice. It's very difficult to hear yourself. So um it's important to just sort of Try, try to remain calm, try to remain um, as aware of your surroundings as possible and listen to what the production team is saying in your ear uh, because it does, they're guiding you. Yeah. They have the best bird's eye view of what they're seeing, what's coming up, um, what you're about to say. So that guidance really is, is it's very, very helpful uh, in those experiences. And of course, if the crowd is loud, that adds to the excitement and you want the crowd to be loud, of course. Uh, but it, it does provide its speed bumps when you're trying to listen to this, you listen to the crowd, you want the crowd to yell. And then plus, I have to tell you about um, many other things that are taking place in this evening, whether it's an upcoming contest and things yeah. you should look out for, um, Canucks for Kids Fund, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but all of it in conjunction is something that definitely took some time. And I will say that there was, um, when I first started, uh, Craig McEwen, who recently joined the Canucks, gave me a lot of great advice on regards to, in regards to like voice control. Oh. And when we're, in, when we're naturally speaking here, Clay, or maybe when you've spoken in, in many of your public speaking mm -hmm. events and for me as well, I tend to sometimes speak from the throat. So if you raise your voice, you're raising it from the throat. However, when you're speaking in an arena, and because of the echo and the way the sound travels in an arena, it doesn't come off as, or it doesn't, it's not received as, as strongly. So you have to almost speak from your gut. Right. And these were sort of adjustments that I had to make that I was aware of, but I wasn't co always consciously thinking about it because uh, it's just not normal. It's not normal practice. So yeah. I figured whom, who is the best in the business that really has that deep speaks from the gut? Well, it's, it's Al Murdoch. Al Murdoch, so you, you have got to, it. You, you have to speak to Al and get those tips on like, well, how do you, how are you conscious of that? Um, what do you do when you get excited instead of screaming? Yeah. How do you speak from the gut to ensure that um, it doesn't come off too high pitch for all the fans in the arena? So all of this was taking place prior to the home opener. So here I am, Clay, thinking about this. Now, you, uh, Mr. Producer is talking to me. I got a lot of fans here, cameras in front of me, and Rennell, three, two, one, go. And all of it was an adjustment at first. But I feel like the level of comfort, which comes with repetition, yeah. um, is continuing to improve and improve and improve. And I'm, I'm just continuously evolving and, and, and getting better and wanting to continuously get feedback from these experts so I can just continue to master this craft and make sure that the fans that are in the arena are enjoying uh, when we're all on the mic. I, oh, I love so much what you said there. I love how you're going to people and constantly trying to learn, not getting complacent. I love what you said because... Yeah, the tendency is it doesn't sound as loud in there as you think you should be, but you do have to yeah. trust the people, the sound engineers that know exactly what volume you have to be. Like, yeah, the tendency would be just to speak up because you don't think you can hear yourself. It's sure that's that's crazy. The other thing I was going to say is um, what I appreciate about you too is um, and I want to get into scripted versus non scripted and how yeah. much leeway you have because I've seen you. I remember and I came to talk to you after the game. It was, I think, you were previewing uh, there's a something about some watch party over the Tyson Fury 
Wilder fight. Sure. And then you, you, I think you, you did something like, uh, you know, and and you, you talked about the fight, and then you gave a quick uppercut, and I, and I came <laughs> to you and I said, well, you know, I really appreciate that because it wasn't. You can tell you just weren't reading a script or memorizing something. Sure. You actually were thinking about what you're saying and trying to convey that. So, talk to me about the how much is scripted versus how much is scripted, and do the producers and your the higher ups give you the freedom to ad lib and just that whole balance? Yeah. So it's a bit. There is a balance. Uh, that's probably the best way to put it. There is definitely um, a script that is sent to the entire team. Um, you know, prior to draft scripts, you go through rehearsals about the mandatory items and the checklist that needs to be announced throughout the mm. evening. So obviously, at this time, masks are mandatory. Um, visit the Canucks team store, Canucks for Kids Fun, Canucks trivia, so on and so forth. Throughout the entire game, if we have sponsored contests, sponsored new segments, there are certain items on the checklist that ideally you stick to the script because there's a tight timeline to fit everything in. And when you're speaking to a large audience or if you're involving a fan, sometimes it's unpredictable on like how that fan answers a question or what that fan does during the contest. So it's important to limit the ad living to give yourself enough insurance for those potential moments that could go left or could go right. Yeah. However, at the same time, they definitely allow the host to add their own flavor, to add their own spice to the mix, to ensure that it doesn't feel one robotic and two, it feels authentic. And I think that was the biggest obstacle that I dealt with at first was because, well, now I had to be adjusting to my voice. So now am I, now am I sacrificing my authenticity? Uh -huh. And that's what I originally thought. No, that the answer was no. I was actually just, improving my vocal abilities and making sure I sound okay. But my main goal was how can I bring my flavor and my spice to the role to ensure that I can continue to be myself, but at the same time, have that balance of learning from the higher ups and getting their advice and sticking to the script when needed. My main um, objective clay is like, I want to make sure that if you're at the game and if I come on the screen, it doesn't feel as though it is sponsored that Rennell is reading a script and <laughs> that's all you're getting from him. And he has to say this and then he says it and it's done. I yeah. want it to feel relatable. I want it to feel like the fan can connect with me or the fan can feel like, hey, if I see that guy up in section 119, I could talk to him. Like yeah. I, I could talk to him about the game. I could talk to him about his role. I want it to feel um, transparent. I want it to feel genuine and I want it to feel authentic and relatable. So all of that, um, allow and and the team wants that to take place as well they want it to feel casual so that's where you get that balance of making sure that there's some items that have to stay on script especially yeah. if it's a sponsored contest i think um the last game against calvary we had a tim hortons coffee cup challenge where we always have little kids involved and in guessing where the timbit is yep. and that's sometimes when you have little kids in there that does get unpredictable so it's important to not ad lib as much but then you have fun moments where you're sort of just um speaking about what's coming up yeah. or what to look forward to. So like that Tyson Fury example. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Rennell, what can you do to add a little yeah. spice to it? I didn't ask them. But I said, you know what? Why don't we uh, add a little uh, jab or uppercut just to just kind of have some fun. And yeah. um, I think the feedback has been positive and they allow yeah. to exercise that own customized flavor and touch that you can bring along with making sure that you stay to the script at those times that are very key uh, throughout yeah. the game. Well, your stick and jab definitely stood out to me. I remember that. So that, that was good. You know, I love what you said, man, about the, the whole balance of being professional projecting versus being authentic. Because, yeah, you don't want to come across as the car salesman. I know. Right? And, and people course, will tell. Yeah. So I, I for what it's worth, when I see you on the screen, you are the same guy on the screen as you are over here when I run into you on the street or in the arena. So that's a good thing to me. Uh, the authentic Ronaldo Desai comes out and it makes me more want to listen to what you have to say. So take that. Uh, for yeah, for sure. And, for sure. And to be honest, I, I think it's so important. One thing that I realized, like in the um, in the media landscape and there there were things when I when I was in at BCIT, there were certain individuals that come to me. I don't want to mention any names. because I know I'm going to forget a name. Sure. But there were many individuals I um, that were very good on providing feedback to those individuals that are young and aspiring of coming into the industry. It's not an easy industry to enter, especially when you don't have a solidified name. Mm -hmm. So it's always important, um, any advice that I would give, and I'm not no expert, but I've 
had a chance to go through this journey for the last few years, it's always important to like ask for that feedback. And you'd be surprised that these individuals that you feel like, oh my goodness, like would they even want to give me, give me feedback? Like they're, they're up here. Like, why would they want to provide me feedback? And there are individuals that, you know, I had experience that I wasn't able to get that feedback or that type of dialogue that I was looking for, but there are also many individuals that did provide it. And those types of individuals have meant so much and have been so impactful throughout the entire broadcasting journey of mine. So it's always important to ask for that feedback. The Canucks do a great job of it. Um, I have to shout out Kerry Adams and Jason Pierce. Those are two individuals that I had a chance to work with at CTV yes. and they continuously give me feedback. So it's always really important for those young and aspiring journalists to look for that feedback, uh, to appreciate it and to accept it. And I also would say to those individuals that are maybe a little bit more experienced, that your feedback is so valuable to those young and inspiring individuals. It's so rewarding for them. So I want to do a good job of continuing to get that feedback for the higher ups, but now being in a position where I can hopefully give feedback to others and be that individual that I sort of aspire to be or accepted and appreciated so much to be that for maybe the up and coming generation as well. Love it. I love it. And speaking of loving things, I love it when you interview the the kid that just finished playing two and a half minutes of intermission hockey or the Tim Hortons coffee challenge. So take us, uh, so I love the way that you're, you're able to draw out answers, but take us behind the curtain. Do you ever help the little kid win the Tim Hortons coffee challenge? Clay, these are secrets we, we cannot <laughs> give up. Now, okay. there, was one, there was one example. I think there was, I think, was it family day night? It might've been just over this last week. So we had an, uh, a little child come up and we usually meet the contestants. So the Tim Hortons coffee cup challenge usually takes place at some point during the period. So at this, at this night, it was like under the six on the first period. Yeah. And keep in mind, this is during your, you know, uh, commercial timeout. So you don't have, you know, a boatload of time to work with. And yet you have that script to follow those sponsor reads to follow. And of course the actual contest. So the child comes up that the uh that the team selected and the child starts crying maybe around the you know three minutes before it's supposed to go on air and he did not want to do it so his dad is there as well i was like all right well no it's okay like no we can get through this dad says what would you want his little brother i was like yeah where's the little brother all right he's sitting around the corner the little brother is wearing an oilers jersey i said and his name and the dad's name was dennis i said dennis if if he wants to do it let's let's have it but listen the kids got to take off that Oilers jersey. We got we to substitute these jerseys here. So they quickly substituted the jerseys. The little kid was very, very cute, but he wasn't going to say anything. And the dad made that very clear. He's not going to cry, but he's not going to say anything. So I said, all right, how do we get this to work? And it's all so happening that, two minutes before go time. Oh, my goodness, yeah. And you got the camera guy. You got everyone look, kind of looking at you. You got fans trying to get in, grab their beer, grab their popcorn, go to the seats. And I'm here with, you know, my little six-year-old trying to advise them to to look at the Timbit to find out where the Timbit is going so they can win themselves a $50 uh, gift card. Um, so this little kid didn't say anything. So in that example, I said, hey, buddy, say dark roast. <laughs> yes, and I said I that on the mic. I was... And the crowd, you know, at the end of the day, everyone knows yeah. it's a little kid and you're going to appreciate that. And you want the yeah. little kid to go home with the prize. And yeah. those are moments where at times when you're dealing with a specific type of contestant, yeah. you may give them a little bit of a heads up. Good. But if you're dealing with an adult, Clay, if you came up there yep. and, and I'm not giving you any hints, you oh. have to look at the screen and you better follow it. But the Canucks fans do a really good job when yes. you want them to get involved, when you want to ask them, hey, is it under this? Is it under that? I mean, you can just base it off the crowd's reaction as well. Renault, that was an amazing answer. And I think uh, I'll just say I've never seen a kid lose. I'll just put it like that. Uh, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your welcome to arena hosting moment? Uh, you don't have to tell us if you got in trouble or anything, but was there... Is there, was there one moment where you're like, oh, dang, uh, looking back, I wish I did that better or I'll never do that again? <laughs> Good question. Um, yeah. One moment, um, not in regards to just what I was doing, but the fact that, wow, I did it. I'm here. Opening night where the Canucks actually entered from the Olympia Tunnel. Usually they obviously yep. enter from their bench. So yep. you know, on the opening night, there's, you know, different... Uh, um, activities that take place and introductions that take place. So I'm standing in the back of the Olympia tunnel. That's where the Zambonis come up. Yeah. And I'm right in the back there, just getting ready for my next hit. And you see all the Canucks coming in. Bo, Pedersen, Besser, those are the first three. 
And I'm looking and I said, holy smokes, this, we did it. Yeah. And I'm just in my head, I'm thinking to myself, do, do I want to take a photo? Do I want to quickly snap a photo? I got, I got Horvat in front of me. No, I can't do that. That looks ridiculous. That was a moment where it just felt amazing to be behind the scenes yeah. in that moment, to see them, just nice little head nod, yeah. fist bump, good luck tonight. Being able to just do that as a fan next yeah. to, that was very, very meaningful. Um, in regards to a specific moment when it came to hosting, there was there was a contest that took place and it's on the ice. And when you're on the ice and there's contests that take place on the ice, they do this before the Zambonis come out. So the ice is chippy. You can walk on the ice. Yeah. You shouldn't be running on the ice, but <laughs> it's it's chippy where you know you have a decent amount of grip. But they always advise if you go on the ice, you have to wear the cleats, the ice Spikes, cleats, yeah, kind yeah. of like steel toe boots, for example. Yeah. Well, Clay, my first ever on ice contest, I forgot to wear the, the cleats. And it's too late to now go back and put them on because the first period is ending in 10, 9, 8, 7, so on and so <laughs> forth. So uh, I would say that was a moment where I felt like, yikes, I should be a little bit more prepared. So I was kind of tiptoeing right. a little bit, felt pretty, you know, felt okay, but. Okay. Uh, I said, oh, man, my first on-ice contest, and I might slip in front of the 18,000. Yes. So uh, that was a moment where I figured, let me make sure I'm a little bit more well-prepared. And virtually during the game, behind the scenes, each host, for the most part, has a lot of time to prepare for their upcoming hit. Right. So you may see a host already go to their section. If I have to be in section 317, well, I might go there well in advance. Or yeah. I might be in the back rehearsing my lines, rehearsing what's coming up in the next segment, maybe yeah. speaking to the contestant that may be involved in that segment and then making your way up there. However, there have been moments where I spent too much time rehearsing and then you hear in your ear, hey, Ronell, are you in 317? Uh, they're gonna be coming up here in three minutes. And the resting room, by the way, is where the Olympia tunnel is in section yeah. one. Yes. Like, well, underneath section 100, really, level zero. <laughs> and oh my goodness, I was sprinting. So by the time you get up there, all right, Ronell, you ready? It's like, let me just catch my breath here. Um, so there's yeah. moments where you just have to make sure you're always, um, aware of the time, aware of your surroundings and uh, ensure that you get enough of practice in yeah. before, before the upcoming set. I love it. And to loop back to the, one of the very first things you said in our chat today, you said there's a couple of things now looking back at your promo, your app audition video that now knowing what you know, you may have changed or done differently. Give me one of those. Cause I, I do know your video quite well. So give me one of those sure. that I'll say. Yeah. Uh, one of those would just be voice control. Um, the, as we just talked about. Yeah. The, um, the way to utilize your voice, the way to deepen your voice when needed, and the overall ability to not emphasize on words that don't need to be emphasized. <laughs> you don't have to say, Canucks for Kids Fund. Buy your tickets for the Canucks for Kids Fund tonight at the end of the second intermission. Why is that guy going up and down in his vocals? We can stay consistent. We can stay casual and we can... And if you stay consistent, you can have that ability to be a little bit more relatable to the viewer, uh, to the audience member. So when you're starting out, when I was starting out, at least I felt like those extra moments of emphasis added to my overall um, value in the audition, but it doesn't. Um, it's important to maintain that even keel uh, casual tone in the arena because it just comes off as a little bit more transparent, but it also just, it hears better. It, it, it is from a fan, it just enhances your experience. So you don't deal with that high pitch. You know, when you go into uh, a classroom and someone's scratching the chalkboard, you just hate that sound. Well, sometimes when you're a really high pitch sound in the arena and it's an incredible sound system in the arena, it doesn't um, come off too well from a fan. So I would say those are a few moments where I look back at that video and say, yep, yeah, now I'm learning. And that, and that was all part of the process, of course. What a great answer. Yeah, you don't want to put the wrong emphasis on the wrong parts. Yes, that was uh, yeah. that's what I did there. That was very good. Okay, uh, one more, and then I want to get to my five-hole that I ask everyone. So this one, yeah, I don't want to make you say anything that you're not comfortable with, but do you sure. put, put do you put any stock in the fact that you're, you're a visible minority on the screen? I think it's awesome I because yeah. um, you, you see diversity. The world that we're living in now, especially the past two years, that's important, and I'm, I'm not saying the Canucks did it, I would never suggest they did it. They would get anyone just sure. for that because you're the best person, but it's so awesome that you're the best person 
and you're a minority. Did, does that ever sure. reson- Does that ever make you think or or appreciate your opportunity? Definitely. Oh, of course. I mean, growing up in the industry when I was when I was young and watching it, you can see the evolution of more minorities being part of our media landscape, um, whether it's in the Vancouver market, really all around, uh, just overall in broadcasting that has continuously evolved. And it's, it's great to see because you don't want to have that as a priority or you're not looking at it through that lens. You know, you're, you're just assuming that that is a talented individual, that individual can do the job, that individual deserves the job. Um, but at the same time, of course, I'm conscious of it. I think this is the first time the Canucks have had a minority in arena host. And that's something that I'm very, very prideful for. I think it means a lot to um, the community, the South Asian community. I know that because I've been able to speak to many members in the community, been involved in the community, and they're very proud and um, grateful for that moment. And I'm not always conscious of it, mm. but when you hear that type of feedback from maybe my elders or the other individuals that um, are always going to games and they want to see more of that um, diversity, you want to make sure that diversity flourishes in all levels of the game. So when you hear that type of feedback, um, it makes it it makes it more impactful, and then you realize, hey, there is there is a meaning here more than just the actual role. There is mm-hmm. an individual out there that may feel they may not get this role based off the way they look or their color of their skin. Yeah. So if this opportunity, if this role allows a sense of inspiration, if it allows for a light bulb to click in this young and inspiring journalist to say, hey, I, I can do that role. It doesn't matter what I look like. I can do the role and I need to continue to get better at it. Well, that to me means more than the actual role itself, because that is that is changing someone's path. That is changing someone's psyche. That's changing someone's mentality. And that's changing the game. You know, we just celebrated Black History Month. I'm wearing this beautiful oh, awesome. uh, d- design hoodie here. That was the first time the Canucks celebrated that back on February 24th. Um, we had the Lunar New Year celebration. We had the Diwali night as well. We are doing a very, very good job of incorporating various different cultures because the game is diverse. Their fans come from all over the world, yeah. from all types of backgrounds, from all types of ethnicities that watch this game. So we need to ensure that we continue to embrace um, that love, that support that we get from a variety of cultures. And if I'm able to continue to be a voice, if I'm continuing to just make an impact for any sort of individual that feels like that's an obstacle for them, well, let me help you knock down that obstacle. We can get it done. And I think, I think it's just very powerful and very impactful. And I'm very, very proud that I can say that, you know, I'm, I'm a South Asian. I'm a very proud South Asian. And I'm just proud to be a part of the Vancouver Canucks. So all that in conjunction, I think, is, is very, very important. And I'm definitely, definitely conscious of it. Awesome. Awesome. Actually, I got one more line. I got one more question before the, the wrap-up sure, questions. Yeah. Um, aside from the obvious, double the amount of people, have you noticed a difference between what the January games were like with 9,000 people versus what the last three have been with the full house. And I, I get it more energy loud, but is there anything else that, sure. or is it simply the volume? I think when you walk into the building, it, you instantly feel the energy. Mm. So when you have half the crowd there, it makes an impact right away. So yeah. from, from our standpoint, how can we, at the end of the day, our, goal is to enhance the fan experience when the fan walks into rogers arena how can we ensure that they enjoy their experience from start to finish so when you have less fans to deal with fans may feel as though it's not as exciting in here there's not Mm. there's not that buzz so in terms of the differences yes obviously the obvious is that it's, it's not as loud but it arguably isn't as enjoyable for even fans because you don't have any uh, many other fans to interact with. Yeah. Or at that time when you're dealing with 50%, most of them are season ticket holders as well. So you have a different type of clientele, different type of um, fan base that is there consistently. So when you have the 100% in there, you have a wide variety of audiences that you can sort of work off of, you can play from, you can laugh at, you can continue to interact with. And I think the buzz in the air when you just have the full crowd, I mean, it does wonders for the Canucks. You know, you get to exercise your full home ice advantage. Yeah. But at 50%, it was tough during the preseason and in those games in January because you're you're trying to get that reaction from the crowd, whether you want them to scream, you want them to sing along. And it's just not as multiplied as if there was, you know, obviously the full sold out capacity crowd that we always 
tend to go for and we and we when we tend to adore and love so yeah. i mean besides the offices there i would just say it affects the overall tone and the aroma of the building so uh you want that aroma and that vibe to be strong and you want it to be electric and that only happens when you have the, the sold out crowd love it ronelle you're the first person i've heard uh, refer to the aroma of a building so i, I do enjoy that very yeah. much it's important <laughs> it is important one thing i want to say here clay before we go to your yeah. uh, next segment yeah um is that I wasn't actually aware, and I'm not sure if the typical fan is, of how many individuals are actually involved in the game presentation mm. uh, for really any sort of professional fan base. Obviously, you go there as a fan and you see some things that take place, but I have to shout out all the individuals. I'm not going to mention any names because I'm going to I'm going to forget a name, but there is a wealth of talented, experienced, and knowledgeable individuals that are part of the game presentation team that once again, their overall goal is to enhance the fan experience. So what can we do? Well, on a night like um, a night where you're playing a div divisional rival, what skits can we have? What more contests can we include? What can we do to make sure that the fan enjoys their time at Rogers Arena, even when the product on ice may not be the best? If it's mm. a tough game and the Canucks are losing four zip, hey, right now we need you to get everyone to sing Sweet Caroline. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, well, the good thing about Sweet Caroline is that Everyone loves Sweet Caroline. They're going to yep. sing it no matter what the score is. But it makes their job a little bit more difficult when you um, yes. are dealing with a tough loss or a tough game. So kudos to the team in regards to ensuring that no matter what um, we see on the ice as the on-ice result, the, the team, the hype team, all the individuals are constantly running around the arena, whether it's upstairs and all the bulls, trying to ensure that this fan's having a good time We get to this spot so on and so forth. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that I wasn't privy to prior to coming into this role. Uh, so that level of appreciation has totally evolved, um, you know, now that I'm being a part of the team. Awesome. Well said. Okay, we're now, we're at the end. So let's do the five hole. These are five, don't feel like you're rushed, but five more rapid answer questions. Uh, just go with your first reaction. Nothing that will, uh, will knock your socks off or anything like that. But let, let's see what happens. Uh, number sure. one, what is the sport that you excel playing at the most? Uh, basketball. Nice. Yeah. Shooting guard or point guard? Uh, I'll go shooting guard. I'm a big yeah. Kobe Bryant fan. Um, That's cool. Had a chance to go to his last game. That's probably one of my favorite sport memories I've ever experienced in my oh. life. It was expensive, but well worth it. Um, but uh, yeah, NHL and NBA are probably the two sports that I'm mostly emotionally connected to. And in terms yeah. of playing basketball, that's something I do as a hobby all the time. Awesome. Awesome. Number two, you are starting a franchise and you can mm. only pick one. Demko, Hughes, or Pedersen? Wow. I am, well, right now, Demko is, he is the backbone of this of this team right now. He's been standing on his head several yep. nights in a row. I'd like to start potentially between the Pirates, but knowing the Vancouver Canucks and their history, yep. Quinn Hughes is a, is, yeah. a, is a defenseman that we, rarely see and that we have rarely had as part of this organization but i'm gonna start on the blue line there clay and i'll go for quinn good answer good answer number three uh you're not gonna offend me with either because i'm half of each do you prefer japanese food or chinese food i'm gonna go chinese food oh yeah but i will say um probably in the last two to three years i've experimented more with japanese food i actually had a chance to travel to japan back in 2005 it was part of a school exchange trip nice. and at that time and there was probably so many dishes in front of me that I would not have appreciated as much as I, if I went today, All right. I wish I need to go back to Japan to enjoy the culture, enjoy the food and, um, and make sure I go out there one day. But right. for now I would say Chinese, but Japanese food is, uh, is no joke. Let me tell you Fair that. enough. Sushi date, me and you coming up soon. How's that? I'm down. I'm set. Okay, you good. Book it. Speaking on food. Number four, this person is paying and you get an hour and a half of their time. Are you going out with Aquilini Rutherford, Alvin, or Boudreaux? <laughs> <laughs> I'd want to, I'm, I'm probably going to say Aquilini. Wow. I'm going to say Aquilini because it's an individual that has the bird's eye view of it all. Yeah. It has been a part of the, obviously, the, the business for quite some time and gets to see it all. So there's many questions that come to mind um, that I may be able to get the real answer is the authentic answers when you're going directly to the source. Um, so I would probably yeah. say Aquilini. It'd be a really nice dinner as well. I'll probably order a really nice dish. Oh, for sure. But yeah. I'm just chuckling to myself for now because uh, when I used to ask this to people last year, of course it was 
Aquilini, Ben and Green, right? It's funny how I had to change that on the fly because of all the anyway, but that's another thing. Okay. Well, finally, that's, why you're, that's why you're an expert, Clay. Oh, yeah, sure. And finally, what's one thing that people don't know about Ronel Desai that you don't mind sharing to the hundreds of people that are going to watch this? What's tell us one other thing about you that we might not know. Oh my goodness. Um could be that a, is hobby, a good question. Could, could be a hobby, could be something crazy that happened to you, could be whatever, dream, whatever. Well, there's two ways to go <laughs> to answer this question. In terms of hobby, um, I love to dance. I've competitive, uh, been in competitive dancing for all my life. That's uh, awesome. In, yeah, in our uh, community and been a part of uh, many different cultural shows and choreographed many items for, for many children uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. Love so it. that continues to be a, a fun community project. And yeah. um, I'm not the best dancer. So don't put me on the spot, but it's something <laughs> that I really, really enjoy. And I haven't, I haven't had a chance to, to do it for quite some time. Okay. Love and it. secondly, just an uh, answer that's not really so much a hobby or passion, but I just think I'm always very mindful of um, my journey and the road that um, and the obstacles that people deal with in this industry. And it's a very, very difficult industry, this media landscape that you are very, very privy to. And I would say the one thing that I'm very, very um, – aware of and conscious of is just to ensure that I want to be in a place and in a role where I can continue to help and assist others and provide feedback and receive feedback when necessary. I'm just so, so passionate about it. And I'm not an expert in, mm. in any of these fields, but I think the experience has taught me a lot about um, the type of individuals that I want to communicate with, what type of feedback is good to receive, what are the right questions to ask. Um, so I think down the line, I can see myself wanting to potentially be uh, an instructor, maybe at BCIT in the broadcasting program, where I can continue to exercise that um, passion of mine to teach the younger generation and potentially, you know, change someone's life and their and their career path. Oh, you're, you'd be an awesome teacher. I, can, I, I know that for sure. Ronell, this has been wonder. This flew by. This is crazy. So thank you for your humility, your uh, how well you articulate yourself, your passion. Thank you for, on behalf of all Canucks fans, for making our experience in the arena and the, the, the fact the team is playing better helps a lot, but it's been a fun, uh, kudos to you, game presentation team, everyone. It's been a, a fun time in the arena and who knows what's going to happen over the last two months with this playoff push. But I, I want to say thank you for your time today and thank you for all you do, uh, who you are and for all you do for all of us Canucks fans, for sure. And I want to add to that, Clay. I want to thank you because in this landscape that sometimes we are consistently surrounded in, Oftentimes it does get negative when we talk about this Canucks <laughs> team and albeit there may be some good reasons. However, sometimes it's hard to get, it's hard to find that light of positivity or that light of the, that silver lining uh, when you're speaking about this team and everyone's doing such a great job on covering this team. Mm -hmm. um, but at times you get lost in that. And one thing that you have always brought to the table is that silver lining you are critical of the team of course but the the philosophy of ensuring that we continue to stay positive that we continue to be aware of different obstacles the team may be dealing with but this is how we can get around them there's always a positive approach to your um philosophy when it comes to this team it's always been that i'm sure you've heard that of course um I think your your thumbs up gif is like the <laughs> summary of like Clay's persona when it comes to the Vancouver Canucks. Um, I appreciate that because um, at times, even I was one of those individuals that are always just as critical of the Vancouver Canucks. They're not doing anything right. But at the end of the day, everyone wants the same thing. Yeah, we all we're all trying to work towards the exact same goals, and everyone just has different roads and paths to get there. So I just appreciate uh, what you bring to the media landscape, what you do uh, in terms of covering this team, what you bring to just your overall fan base. Um, that light of positivity is much needed. It helps when the product is also good, uh, but it's much needed and, and needed uh, in this industry. So so appreciate that, Clay. Really, you're really doing a good job in that. Oh, I appreciate okay. the kind words, Ronell. And yes, you are a lifetime member of the GLCPC, as you know. So I look forward to seeing you at the next game sometime in mid-March. I think I'm there the 11th and 13th. I'm not there for the 9th, but I will. I look forward to giving you a fist bump in the corridors and we'll go from there. So Ronell, thanks again and uh, keep up the great work, man. You're awesome. Thanks, Clay. All right, take care. Take care.